So what I'm, we'll, we're going to try and do a bit of an exercise before lunch. So I'm going to get you guys thinking, talking to each other. Myself and Sam will walk around and help you. So just a quick uh, intro to myself and Sam. So I'm, I'm the director for innovation and development. Um, I left data science about a couple of years ago and we started doing more stuff outside of insurance. So we as a business in insurance, we're very good at that. The market's shrinking with autonomous cars and everything. So we decided, hey, let's start building businesses that leverage other skills and other technologies. Um, so today, I'm going to run you through an exercise. So this is a project we've got on our backlog. We're probably going to get onto it relatively soon. So that you guys are going to help us a little bit with some of the thinking here is around TLDR. Um, do you want to do an intro? Shall I introduce you? OK, so Sam, Sam basically is my team facilitator. So anything team-wise, she basically manages all of that and looks after what I do and what the team does. So um, she's quite linked in on this. So you'll find on your table a couple of sheets, and I'll talk through what those are for. Very quickly, what's TLDR? There was a regulation that was being kind of batted around in America, and it's how it all came to be for me, is uh, I hate terms of service or terms of conditions. I don't know how many of you guys have actually read any of those. They are incredibly horrible. And I'll be honest, the few I've read, I went, OK, I I'm not sure I can sign this. For one thing, it sounds horrible, and I'm not actually sure I want to sign this away. So they are not set up to give people what I would define as informed consent. So for those of you who were here yesterday when we were talking about the AI ethics and um, the whole concepts around kind of design with trust and making sure that things are built with us as consumers in mind, that concept of one size doesn't fit all. You know, we heard a couple of the last uh, the second to last speaker talking to that point, right? So the idea really came about from, okay, can we take these really complicated documents and simplify it? Of course, OpenAI chucked out ChatGPT and GPT-4, and then that became much more, ooh, actually, we can do this. This is a possibility. So I'm not trying to lead you guys down a pathway here in your idea, but that's where my thinking went. That's where the team's thinking went. And we started kind of looking at this. So I'm going to not talk for too long, and I'll bring this slide back up so you've got the problem statement. But a real bit of background. What I feel is very important is to ensure that people have the ability to know what they're signing up for. So I want to be able to, from, my, uh, from you know, the products I'm releasing, that we give terms of service that are straightforward and simple. We've done a lot of research with the university here in Bristol around explainable AI. More importantly, how do we take what we do from a, let's say, data science perspective and explain it to the general public in, uh, the, excuse the, uh, the phrasing, but layman's, right? How do you put it in simple, straightforward language that anyone can pick up and go, oh, yeah, OK, I get that, right? I'm happy to give you my data. I'm happy for you to do that processing. So that's kind of where it all came from. And then, of course, then that laddered up to go, well, why can't we do that across everything and the way that we operate. So that's the background. Again, you know, there's more text there. But essentially, what I want to be able to do is anybody can access it. It's set up as a tool for literally even the youngest of us, right? Um, so that's the problem. And I want to talk about the process. And I'm going to really speed run through this. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you'll see why, because uh, I'd like to give you as much time to do the, do the actual thinking as possible. So design thinking is a process that we apply internally quite heavily. This is not ours or mine. Uh, the one that you're looking at is actually de designed by IDEO, a design thinking company. They do this in, uh, for real. But the simplicity is you start off by gathering a bunch of data about your problem. And you really think about it. You talk to people. So here, you're not going to get a chance to talk to people. But you guys can brainstorm and think about it, use each other as your uh, test group. And pull out more and more about, well, OK, what is it that we're trying to solve? What's the information? What's the data? And spend some time, you know, as it says, empathizing with your group. Once you've done that, you can start to articulate and actually write down from there, well, what is it we're trying to solve? And typically, what you'll find is this, and the reason for the arrows is this divergence convergence concept. You diverge away. You get lots and lots of data. And you use that data to slowly come in and define what is that we're trying to kind of accomplish. And then from there, you, know, you pass through that exploration phase, and you'll notice you got one, slide, uh, one piece of paper there that actually helps you explore the market and understand what you're trying to attempt. 
after you do that, you start solutionizing, right? So again, you start diverging away. You get a lot of solutions. Hey, okay, this problem we can solve like this. And you know that most people, uh, and I've found this typically, and I'm going to go slightly on a tangent, go to the solution first rather than thinking about the problem. So I want you guys to really think about the problem. So I don't really mind if you don't get through all of it, although it would be nice for you, from an exercise perspective for you to get through all the sheets. But think about the problem. Then get to that kind of solutionizing and getting more and more fine-tuned in that ideation process of expanding and contracting of, okay, this is a great solution, but this is why it might not work, or this might create an inequality, or it doesn't really fit everybody. It's a bit of a, you know, it fits a bunch of people, but it doesn't fit everybody. So think about that kind of, are we creating inclusivity through this process? So a few principles that you guys can, again, come up with. And then lastly, the last sheet is, the creating your prototype. Now, prototypes can be designed in multiple ways. Here, you're gonna do it on a piece of paper, um, and you're gonna kind of draw out how's the user gonna interact, what's the user experience through the app or through the website or through the, the platform, and what is it that they're gonna see, and how you're gonna make it so that they have a simple journey. So coming back to the uh, original statement of the, the talk is, is essentially about taking this really complicated thing that we're trying to do, and we do that on a regular basis as a team, and un hide it underneath a transparent layer that you don't need to go into if you just wanna operate at the top layer. So I want you guys to think about when you're doing the prototype is that top layer of how are we gonna make this simple for people to interact with so we're not adding more complexity or making it harder for them, right? So you're gonna go through those three phases and the, the three, I believe I've got that slide, the three documents kind of, the, the, papers you've got on your table will help you walk through those three, um, those, those three kind of stages in it. So I'm going to stop talking here. I'll walk around and I'll kind of come and chat with you guys. So I'm hoping you can, I, I've given you enough for you to start with and I'll pop the slide back up. So you've got the problem <coughs> statement written nicely there. So over to you to start, really. You can focus it on whatever you want. I think I'd like to go around the tables now, really uh, listening to all of you. Weirdly enough, each table's come up with a slightly variant and, and very, in some cases, very different solution. And also, uh, on the problem stadium, well, well, exactly what market you guys are going to. So I'd, I'm going to kind of go that way, and hopefully we can kind of get a bit of that problem and where you're going brought out. So I'll hand it over to you guys to start with. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking about uh, customer needs first, and we actually started thinking, I think, too far down the, the food chain, so we actually started thinking about you know, me as a, as a user looking at terms and conditions and clicking it or not clicking it. Um, but then we thought, well, actually, that's not where the business model is. The business model is with whatever the market provider is that I'm clicking through to. So that's, that's the market. So we were thinking contract lawyers, technology lawyers embedded in companies that are in a kind of sweet spot somewhere between startups and big SMEs, probably, because the, the really big crimes, the Googles and Apples of this world, and we're not sure they care very much or are worried very much about, <coughs> about um, legislation or paying fines. And then at the bottom end, you've got open source and creative commons type activities which are not relevant either so it's that the market is somewhere in the middle so we we're thinking that obviously this is we want to create a hypothetical product which improves the accessibility and legibility and digestibility of these uh, of these terms and conditions but in a way that is also implementable and legal for the for the kind of the market companies themselves so we were we then started thinking about kind of scoping out ideas for 
some kind of automated digital um, product which would allow you to ingress, which would create shorter, all the S's, shorter, simpler and structured um, documents um, through uh, some kind of dashboard with easy digital upload of existing terms of contracts and automatic summaries and then a kind of virtual cycle of review processes for, for lawyers. And that's about as far as we've got. That is a really interesting discussion. Yeah. I think that sounds amazing. And, and going to the lawyers, definitely, I don't think we came onto that when we were looking at it either, to go to the lawyers and actually say, actually, you're the ones who are going to use it. And I love the idea of actually then helping them evolve what they're writing, rather than just saying, okay, you've written something and now we're going to digest it into something simple. And actually going, well, why don't you just write it simple to start with? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to get the lawyers in the room and go, yeah, why don't we do that? And then that will be a great discussion. But I'm going to hand over to this table. Who's going to talk? Um, so, yeah, we define our customers as a home buyer. Um, and then uh, they need as uh, someone who wants to ensure the building and its content. So, obviously, as a home buyer, you get the 100 pages of <laughs> TNC that you have to just press OK to move to the next one. Um, so, we wanted to simplify the idea is to, to provide customers with a sort of simplified, maybe um, summary bullet points of the TLCs. Um, to have explained sort of what, what is covered within the insurance for the building and its content. Um, yeah, the uh, market size apparently in the UK is 6.3 billion um, pounds, <laughs> so it's a huge one. Um, the structure of, we've gone to sort of defining as uh, the direct purchasing from the insurer and then through the brokers, which does the way, but uh, that was the conclusion. Um, and then we've defined the landscape as to um, primary needs is to have a peace of mind and uh, have our you know, building and content insured, or um, and then secondary need as a price. That's how far we've gone. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 30 minutes is not very long. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. And I think we, so we, we did think about the whole conveyancing and the legal side on buy, house buying, and I think that's that's a that, that's a black art because yeah, I think when I when we bought our house the document was kind of that thick, and you read through it and you miss so much because it's just written in a really nonsensical and the orders are just all over the place. But yeah, cool guys, come over here. Who's going to talk? Hello. Um, so we decided to go with. Um, UK voters and kind of looking at breaking down complex political manifestos. So that would be one of our customer needs. Try to create clear language um, that contextualises users' life experiences. Um, maybe perhaps has a locational element to it as well. Um, for market attractiveness. Um, our market size would be 4 million, which is the amount of registered voters. Um, our market structure would follow um, apps and websites. Um, and our market trends were to try and engage more in politics, maybe improve the distrust that exists. Um, and we could uh, cover a bit of Brexit too. Um, our competitive landscape, so the primary need would be to distribute info the secondary need could be to decide between different parties and encourage voting. Um, so when we were looking at the custom proposition, simply put, it's to decode political jargon. 
um, the customer benefits would be understanding political promises that have been made, um, but increasing transparency by having a better understanding of what the actual impacts would be, which is where we talked about like, contextualising to the local and regional, because what is said and promised isn't always what happens in reality. Um, and also looking at decreasing mis <laughs> misinformation, so again, a little think back to the, the bus. Uh, and then sort of the features would be around having um, an overall summary that's easily in easily digestible format, but again with that contextualised to individuals so you can look at the local regional impacts, what would the national impact be, and then potentially some of the policy areas have global region impact as well. And in terms of our business model, we would want to make it free to the public, so we would be looking at how local authorities would be essentially be paying for it. Um, and then we looked at an app and web-based to sort of allow for differing levels of digital literacy. So if people don't have smartphones, then they can still go into, say, citizens advice or local libraries who can then access it and via the web. Um, but we didn't get further around that business model of like how that works in practice. That's very cool. Uh, very, very cool. And then we didn't think about politics as a place to go, and I think that's a whole other minefield <laughs> to break into. Well, I, you know, the whole Brexit thing, I think it's a really good point. Demystifying some of the concepts and, and what's actually being put out there is quite important. So, uh, who's going to talk from this table? Oh, okay. <laughs> you do it. No, you do it. You're So, we spent a long time talking about the market opportunity and trying to decide on a target customer. And that's basically as far as we got. Um, we were trying to understand, we can see really the needs of the person clicking through the terms and conditions, but we were trying to understand what that actually gives. And we hadn't landed actually on mid-level companies. We were trying to understand how maybe Amazon could benefit from this. Uh, and we tapped ourselves into kind of a circle, thinking that maybe it would actually be harmful to somewhere like Amazon, where people might actually see something, understand something that they don't like, and try and take action. So. Um, we didn't get much further than that. We were thinking about maybe in these large companies, we'd be targeting specifically uh, bringing together people from legal and sales and maybe IT who are going to be working with this and, and how do we bring them together in something that kind of automates in some level translating these terms and conditions while actually uh, continuing to kind of cover legally the reasons that we have them in the first place. Um, yeah. Good. Same just that we, we kind of realised um, that we need a lot more research and, yeah. and maybe we, we, uh, we're a bunch of sceptics because we were like, yeah, we kind of get you, we kind of get your issue, but we need to understand a bit more um, the research. Yeah, do people make purchasing decisions based on transparent terms and conditions? Is this actually going to, you know, harm companies like you were saying because people might have more and spend differently and so we need a bit more information. And I guess, is there a market drive, even if there are better terms and conditions, are people going to read those at all? Or are people just going to say, my data is everywhere anyway, who cares? Yeah, yeah I think it's interesting because this is a debate that you have with customers, is customer sentiment versus behavior. They're very, very different things, right? Everyone wants to know what's going on and you know, sign up for those things, but then you ask the question, about, would you spend five minutes looking through something uh, you know, how, again, cookies are a great example on websites, right? How many people actually spend the time to look at what cookies are being accepted or you just hit the, uh, accept the cookies and just go with what they're asking for. You know, changing customer behavior is a challenge. I love the debate around, well, is this not going to be harmful for our customers? Because, you know, the transparency isn't always a good thing. But I think, again, like I said, 30 minutes is not a long time. We typically take roughly a month to go through this, so you know, we did really kind of, you guys got through this a lot faster than I thought. The last time we ran this kind of session, it took a couple of hours before you know, some of this stuff got filled out. But the, the, the challenge I think I was trying to put out is um, the way that we approach designing concepts, you know, taking an idea from really this, even, even before this stage of not even having that problem statement written down to getting a proposition out it's all driven through, let's capture some information, let's get some data, and it's all about data, right? And the power of capturing information, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is huge, and then spending that time to analyze it. 
the more time you spend analyzing it, the more likely you're going to get a product that is actually fit for the end customer. So, you know, I just wanted, I think, when I was asked to give this, is, I was thinking, well, actually, it'd be great to walk you guys through the process we follow. I think the insights you're all coming with are, well, we need more research, we need more information. That, that is 100% true. Right. Um, I think that's, that's it, really. Thank you so much to you both for coming with me. Let's give a round of